So thanks, Janis, for the introduction. Uh, I'm personally a fan of face-to-face -face meetings, but under the given circumstances, you guys did a great job in organizing this event. So congratulations. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to present today. I would like to start with a kind of a probably a, a statement that might cause some discussions. And this is that, as we all agree, there is a growing population. We'll expect uh, about uh, 11 million people by 2100, uh, that there is also an increased demand for food. I think this has been discussed over the course of the day. Um, and we, I think we agree that there is the, the investment in ag tech is one way to support this increased food demand and to provide supply for this food demand. And the statement I want to make that one that might lead to some discussions is that dairy products will remain an important nutritional source. Uh, there are discussions going on, especially in larger cities about uh, dairy supplements, but I'm saying dairy products will remain imp an important nutritional source. So we have to think how we can uh, produce dairy products sustainable and uh, reliably. So one thing that might be not seen by uh, too many people is a simple fact that cows transform unusable grass to valuable food for humans. And especially uh, me growing up in an alpine region, uh, there is a long tradition of having cows on high altitude areas in areas where you couldn't grow hops or corn or which you couldn't arable uh, like in a conventional way. And then the farmers made dairy products out of a milk like cheese, could store it and then eat it over the course of the winter. And today, 5% of the energy in the global diet is based on dairy. And only 3% of the cow land is actually arable. But there are estimations that 86% of the livestock feed is not consumable by humans. So actually, if we there, there is the discussion going on about how sustainable beef is, yes, but dairy products are actually sustainable and contribute only 1% of the global gas house uh, contribution. So now I have introduced uh, or motivated the dairy production. We step a little bit into the how this dairy production looks like today. Uh, we have in the global uh, dairy cow market, we have about 700, uh, sorry, 70 million cows in managed dairy farms in about 100 plus countries. There are some very important regions like the Atlantic regions in, in Europe, like Northern Germany, UK, Ireland, uh, France. And then also we have these important dairy areas in the US um, around the Wisconsin area, the lake area, and then also the larger farms in California. We also have Australia, New Zealand, uh, just to mention a few. Asia, China is starting to grow uh, and invest a lot into the dairy market. Uh, and what are the challenges and trends for today dairy farmers? We have stricter regu regulations, uh, stricter regulations regarding uh, the use of, let's say, hormones, antibiotics, all that stuff we as the consumer don't want to see in our food. And in parallel, we also have less qualified personnel uh, and we has, have also a tremendous uh, consumer pressure on the milk price. This is also something a lot of people aren't seeing that obviously, but there is research going on what prices consumers have in mind. And basically, it's only a basket of 10 products. And these 10 products might vary in the different countries. But for sure, there is always one product in there. And this is how much is one liter of milk. 
So consumers are very sensible to the milk price, whereas with other products, let's say one liter of olive oil, uh, consumers aren't that sensitive and potentially are willing to pay more. So uh, we have a challenge on the milk price for the farmers. And we all know if uh, a reasonable price isn't paid for a, a product, the pressure is on the production. So what are the, uh, what are the, uh, sorry, there was a, a mess up in the slide. So I was one slide ahead. Um, so what are the consequences for farmers? The consequences for farmers are that uh, a growing herd size is combined with a decreased number of farms. So fewer farms have now to manage a larger herd size. Um, and this uh, is also a reason that the efficiency of the farm has to increase. And this means we have a higher financial pressure on the farms. So what's the solution now? We say that a sustainable dairy production is possible through digitization and automation. Now the question is, how can we digitize a, a cow, a dairy cow? Um, here comes Smegstec into play. Smegstec has developed a bolus that enables the digitization of the dairy production. The bolus is resting inside the cow, inside the radiculum of the cow permanently for the lifetime of the cow and is continuously monitoring health and helps to prevent sicknesses of the dairy cow and thus keep the milk yield high. How is uh, this setup working? And you have seen something similar in, if you have seen the previous talk of uh, Gottfried Bessel, and this is a sensor. Sensor is in the cow's uh, reticulum in the stomach. The sensor is sending, is monitoring data, is pre-processing data, is sending data to a base station. The base station is receiving the data, is again doing some processing, sends it to the cloud, and the farmer can access the data from their mobile devices, whether that's a handheld or a PC, a browser, completely independent of the local farm software infrastructure. If we look a little bit into the technical details, as I wasn't, uh, as I didn't know how tech, uh, how deep we want to dive into the tech here with this AI conference, but it's a classic uh, cloud system. I will not dive too deep into it, but the ingress is done through a Loravan network and Loravan uh, server. Then we go into our cloud infrastructure where we do some processing and I have a, a separate slide showing a bit more detail on that. And then we have a real-time database that is providing the data onto the app, which you can access from your app or your uh, browser. We also offer an API that can be embedded in uh, customer applications. From the stream processing, we look at the raw processing data where we do some data cleaning, data filtering, some uh, drift correction. And then out of this uh, raw data, we extract features and the features are used for further decision making. And this means uh, a certain classification. Uh, this means adaptive thresholding, or this can also mean approaches like machine learning out of uh, big data sources. What we end up for the customer is a measurement for the inner body temperature, the movement and activity and the rumination of the cow. The cow needs to ruminate and we measure directly the rumination in the reticulum of the cow. 
So what can the farmer do now? If we look at this diagram, you see now the rumination of the cow with the green bandwidth showing what is the uh, optimal rumination time per day. Uh, in the middle, we see the temperature, the actual temperature of the cow. You see these spikes. These spikes indeed down uh, to a lower value indicate drinking, uh, drinking cycle because each time the cow drinks water, the temperature drops. The black line is the average temperature. And below the red line, the red curve you see is showing activity. What can we now do with the data? What's uh, the, of course, the farmer can look at it, but what the farmer really wants is early detection of any potential uh, cow sickness or disease. Because if dairy farmer recognizes a potential uh, disease or sickness early, he can apply conventional treatments like giving simple anti-inflammatories instead of if you see or recognize the disease when it becomes clinical, that you have to give antibiotics, for example, because you're late, the infection is severe, and then uh, you mess up the uh, basically the udder of the cow and you have milk loss and potentially permanent uh, damage to the cup. Um, in this graph, you see how such a health alert could look like. You see in the lower left, you see how the green curve is dropping, indicating that rumination goes down. But even prior to that, you see a clear rays of temperature indicating the potential start of an infection. And we have these various uh, alarms and based on these alarms, the farmer can react. And I think best is if I show two cases, one where the farmer was able to react early and the other one where he ignored the alarms and um, I can show you what this meant for his dairy cow and the production. Uh, here you see the typical conduct of uh, mastitis case without smack stick. For all of you who are not farmers, mastitis is one of the uh, diseases and our sicknesses of a dairy cow, which has probably the most severe economical uh, impact of the pharma and it's an infection of the other. So what's happening here? Uh, again, on the top you see uh, rumination in the middle temperature and on the bottom you see activity. And if you now look at this first temperature alarm, you see only a very slight increase of temperature. And this slight increase is only for a couple hours. Then the temperature goes back to normal. From the outside, zero is visible. You see that the cow still ruminates nicely, so no indication. If this alarm is neglected, let's say at the early period of lactation, this is the early period after the cow gave a birth to a calf and the milk production is starting to raise, if there is a, a other infection, this could be severe. So going back to the point, the farmer, let's say, neglects this temperature increase, does nothing. We see about one and a half days later, another temperature increase. This time a bit higher, but again, uh, it resolves, the cow recovers, um, all looks fine. Slight drop in rumination, but also rumination recovers well. So you could say, again, nothing has happened. But now the third increase comes of temperature. And this increase is severe now with a steep drop of rumination. Now the infection has become clinical with visible outside symptoms in the milk, for example. The cow is really sick. Now the farmer has to apply antibiotics. Milk cannot be used anymore and the cow needs to recover. 
Here is the example with the use of SmackStack, our system. If at the first temperature alarm, the pharma gives a simple anti-inflammatory, something which doesn't affect the quality of the milk or doesn't have any negative impact like antibiotics. We see there is a recovery, a drop in temperature, rumination stays nice, high at the level where it should be. Uh, you even see a drop in temperature after the raise, which is an indication that the giving of the anti-inflammatory is working with a slight drop of temperature. So therefore, that we have a drop of temperature alarm as an indicator for successful treatment. Cow is happy, pharma is happy, we are as customers can be happy. The system not just can do, uh, can reduce the usage of antibiotics to the farmer, he can also help the farmer keep the animals fertile without the use of hormones because there is a very, very reliable heat detection uh, attached to it. We see here uh, a change in activity and a drop in rumination, which clearly shows the cow is in heat and is ready to be inseminated. We give the optimal insemination window. Um, then um, here you see basically on the top, on the bottom left, basically a, a an ample system showing the ideal time for insemination. Uh, due to time, I think I jump over this. Um, and in addition to the insemination, up to the heat detection, there's also a calving detection. Uh, whenever a cow gets pregnant, at some point she has to give birth to a calf and the farmer uh, needs to know when the calf is coming. And again, this inner sensor provides super accurate and reliable temperature measurement. And the giving birth of a calf is indicated by a drop of the average body temperature of 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. And the sensor is sensible enough to catch this slight drop reliably. And then the farmer knows that within the next 10 to 15 hours, the cow will give birth to the calf. So we have a very, very precise prediction of calving. Again, this is provided and sent to the cloud and the farmer, the user of the system, the veterinarian, the nutritionist, whoever is using the system or whoever is giving access to the data by the farmer can have access to the system and read the data and work towards healthy and happy cows. So this was my talk. I have shown how to make dairy production sustainable and profitable by reducing the use of hormones, by the reduce of drugs and keep cows, farmers, and customers happy and healthy. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stefan. And I know that you have to run and you have a, a, a hard cut at two. However, we have two questions and maybe I can direct them towards you. Um, first question, pretty straightforward. What exactly are you measuring in the cow? We are measuring the body temperature the rumination, which is basically the contraction of the rumen, and we measure the activity of the cow, so how the cow is moving. And okay, indirectly okay. With, with the temperature, we also can measure drinking cycles. Um, yeah. Awesome. Is, yeah. And then straight away, the second question, is there an option to replace a bolus if it fails permanently? As the dairy cow is a ruminating animal, so the food goes into the first stomach, so to say, into the rumen, to, to simplify it. And then uh, through, rumi through the rumination process, food comes up again and the cow starts to chew and then it goes into another stomach. So 
we needed in order to measure reliably we need to design the bolus such that it stays in the reticulum permanently uh, otherwise it there would be the danger that the cow chews on the bolus or, or that there is some danger to the cow and um, therefore it has to stay there permanently but if you think that the stomach of the cow has the size of approximately a bath tube and you throw in such a sensor of that size it doesn't affect and there is a proven uh, proven research and uh, testification that the bolus doesn't affect the health of the cow in a negative way. Uh, the bolus is, by the way, also FDA approved. Awesome. Thank you so much for that clarification, Stefan. Thank you so much for spending uh, your time with us. Um, all the best. And if you have any more questions to, to Stefan, I'm sure uh, that he will be happy to answer them within the conference setting or also uh, outside in a future call or meeting. Absolutely. Thank you, Hannes. And thanks for organizing this. It was a pleasure and fun. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so Bye. much.